Bli erg. Oh, come on, Sorbin. An exasperated voice carried out over the water, how do you even have anything left in there? Jemaine Linez looked up from her manifest at the apprentice hanging over the edge of the boat. Another apprentice stood beside him, no, she was standing a safe distance away from him with both hands on her hips. Four other apprentices moved about the deck, preparing to disembark as they approached the southern end of Warden's Vale. At first, they had all been uncomfortable being trapped on the ship with its undead crew. The Death Warrior was especially imposing, but its strange hat offset things somewhat. Even after a few months, most of the city folk felt that way with the undead that were now a visible part of their everyday lives. Children could get used to anything, so they didn't think much of returning to life as usual, but the grown men and women in E-Rantel still kept their distance on the off chance that the undead started acting more like the undead. To those who were unaccustomed to the sight, it probably seemed that the citizens of E-Rantel were perfectly fine with the undead. Perfectly fine, however would rapidly disintegrate when they came too close for comfort. It varied by person and it varied by the type of undead, but it was rare to find someone completely unaffected by their presence. People didn't care much about skeletons. Death knights and elder liches were given around a two or three meter berth on the street. Most tricked themselves into thinking that soul eaters were just different looking horses. If the sorcerer king randomly came around the corner, which he often did for some reason, it was anything just short of running and screaming, since doing so might be interpreted as les majeste. There were rumors that some people could even speak to the sorcerer king without flinching, but the only ones Germain knew of who could do that were Momen and Nobby of Darkness. The skeletons crewing the ship appeared to be skeleton warriors, a type much stronger than the skeleton labor used around the city, but they had all become comrades that had to suffer Sorbin's troubles over the past day. The kid it heaved and Richard and Richard and heaved. Every bend in the river and eddy along their course brought a fresh new variation of his nauseating performance. One had to pay attention to when he took a drink, if the wind hit it just right as it came back out, it would all come spraying back onto the boat and into their faces. Initially, Germain was wary over any stains that Sorbin left on the spotless deck, wondering if he would become an additional stain on the deck should the Death Warrior become sick of him being sick. The ship was as pristine as the floor of the shining golden pavilion, save for the sails that had a bit of patchwork on them. Any scores or chips in the wooden hull had been filled with some sort of alchemical agent and carefully refinished. The more romantically inclined might have considered the overall appearance comfortably adventurous. Sorbin wretched over the side again and Germaine shook her head. She had heard of people getting sick riding wagons, but this was really something else. We're done checking things over in the back, Miss Linez. Germaine turned her attention away from Sorbin towards another apprentice, Pam, who was helping her go over their inventory. Anything broke? No ma'am, Pam replied, the trip's been pretty smooth. They glanced to the side of the ship as Sorbin heaved over the edge again. Seriously, where did he keep all that? Jermaine handed off her manifest, motioning for Pam to take over. She got herself out of the way, heading to the bow of the vessel to look out over the river. Warden's Vale really was a nice place. High peaks over sheer cliffs lined the eastern bank of the river, and a broad valley lay to the west. Now that Jermaine could see over the high western bank, a vast wetland stretched out before her, all the way to the opposite side. Settlements of some sort were raised over the water on the southern end, but she couldn't make out who their inhabitants were. The stone bank rose, once again obscuring her view. The ship sailed along a stony island that jutted up well above its mast. After some time, they eventually came to a lowered area along a waterfront that Germain presumed was fashioned with the same methods used in Colin Harbour. At a glance, this section of the island appeared to be a harbour, though it was dissimilar to the one at Colin Harbour which required the ship to pass through locks to get in and out of. Dozens upon dozens of openings could be seen cut into the stone as they sailed along. By the look of it, the harbour in Warden's Vale was composed of individual berths that could raise ships to the level above rather than having the entire harbour placed well over the flood line. At the end of the waterfront, a pier jutted out into the river. Over the water, two banners fluttered in the morning breeze, the crimson and gold standard of the Sorceress Kingdom and the head of a white raven over a field of forest green. The latter brought to mind the sigil of House Saradnik that Germaine's paperwork was more frequently displaying as of late, and she supposed there was little reason for it to be anything but. The ship glided in towards the pier, turning slowly as the death warrior worked the tiller. 
It stepped over and used its foot to gently settle the ship against its moorings. The skeleton crew put away their oars and set about securing the vessel. Jermaine Lanez, a raspy, almost feminine voice called out her name. She turned to the right, finding an elder lich standing on the pier with a clipboard in hand. That's me. You have arrived on schedule. Direct your minions to the designated transports. At the base of the pier, eight wagons, each drawn by a soul eater, were lined up. Six of them were loaded with timber. The other two were empty. It appeared self-explanatory. All right, minions, Jermaine turned to address her apprentices with a grin. You heard what the elder lich said. Let's start getting our stuff off there. That will be unnecessary, the elder lich cut her off. Four death knights walked down the pier towards them. Their tower shields were conspicuously missing, so she supposed that they were there to handle the cargo. All right then, Germain said, out of the way, minions. Get to your, ah, uh, designated transports. I'm not your minion damn it. One of her apprentices complained, I woe. A gauntleted hand reached down and yanked the apprentice out of the ship. He paled as he was dangled face to face with the death knight that held him. An unauthorized presence? The elder leech's voice turned grave. W. I let go. What happens to unauthorized individuals? Jermaine looked up at her struggling apprentice. Under regular circumstances, illegal immigrants are processed by local authorities. The nature of your arrival, however, mandates legal action under the National Secrets Act. The elder lich turned to the death knight. Take this one to be tried by Lady Zaradnik. Jermaine and the other apprentices looked on in morbid curiosity as the increasingly panicked cries of her apprentice echoed over the harbor. It was a scene that would have incited panic in the city, but the only other witnesses in the area that could be seen were undead. The death knight did not go far, as Lady Zaradnik was waiting near the wagons. The baroness doll figure struck as gallant an impression as ever, maybe even more so now. She had the image of one of those squeaky clean nobles that little girls love to fantasize over, except she was decidedly female. The baroness frowned slightly as the apprentice was dangled before her, and he blushed despite his circumstances. Maybe it worked that way, too. Don't tell me he's another one of those. Lady Zaradnik muttered. Another one of what, my lady? Germaine asked. Once in a while, no, it has been happening more often now, well, that is not important. Is this one of yours? Yup. Lady Zaradnik looked up at the death knight, and the apprentice flew into the nearest empty wagon bed. You weren't kidding about that security thing, Jermaine crawled in with the rest of her apprentices. Why would I joke about something like that? Lady Zaradnik said from the front seat of the wagon, you and your apprentices did read all of the related materials beforehand, I trust? I did, my lady, Jermaine replied, but at least one dumbass here didn't take it to heart. While they didn't mandate anything like securing their magical technology with explosive countermeasures against tampering, the Sorceress Kingdom was still extraordinarily strict when it came to their magic item industry. New research was restricted to secure, isolated areas approved by the government. These sites were not officially listed anywhere for public knowledge, but neither were they a secret. The industries at these locations were either the property of the crown or the realm's nobles. New items had to go through an approval process, dictating to whom and where the items could be produced and distributed. Even after being approved for distribution, imports and exports were carefully tracked. For those purchasing magic items, the process was seamless and would probably appear to be more convenient than before. Those within the industry, however, understood just how much the administration was keeping an eye on things. Still, Jermaine recalled something unsettling she had noted while reading the legislation, there's only a minimum punishment listed for infractions. That is correct, Lady Zaradnik replied. Doesn't that technically mean you can do anything to an offender? Anything that meets the minimum required penalty, yes. Jermaine wondered what Lady Zaradnik would do if a spy or thief was discovered. House Zaradnik, for all of its obscurity, was well known for being extraordinarily austere and reportedly merciless towards intruders. The Death Knights finished loading their cargo and the Soul Eaters brought their wagons up the gentle incline leading to the main harbor level. The tops of the berths that were cut into the stone could be seen stretching along the waterfront for a few kilometers. They were each several times the length of the ship they had arrived in. Around the nearest one, a vampire bride, an elder lich, 
and several Death Knights and Death Warriors were working to put together some unknown apparatus. What's going on there? She asked. They are putting together a gantry crane, Lady Zaradnik replied. Wagner and Colin say that the loading time for ships and wagons must see vast improvements to deal with the increased industrial production of the Sorcerer's Kingdom. If not, we're going to have problems keeping up with our logistical needs. After being stuck with a single vessel for nearly two seasons, I am forced to agree. Even with Death Knights working for you? Even with Death Knights, Lady Zaradnik nodded. Walking in and out with crates, bags and bulk freight while trying to organize everything takes far more time than people give the process credit for. I believe Lady Shiltier has provided us with an excellent solution, but we are still trying to make it work with what we have. What is it? Confidential, Lady Zaradnik replied with a straight face. Jemaine made a face of her own, eyeing their surroundings as the wagons rolled by a long row of cargo yards and warehouses under construction. Corlin Harbour was amazing in its own right, but the ambitious undertaking arrayed before them was overwhelming. By now, everyone in Erantel knew about undead labour and what it meant for the industrial output of the Sorcerer's Kingdom. Seeing the infrastructure being built to support this change made one keenly aware of its sheer magnitude. They turned a corner, following some unmarked trail over the barren ground of the island. Past the partially built front row of warehouses lay a vast, undeveloped space. The barren island stretched north to the horizon, while a looming hill rose to the south. On the other side of a deep depression that ran through the middle of the island was a cluster of buildings roughly two kilometers away. Beyond them, she could see the wetlands below the island stretching into the distance. Is that where we're going? Jemaine pointed at the buildings. That is the commercial district, Lady Zaradnik replied. Your facilities are below the hill to the south, where most of the government buildings and protected industries will be. This all probably looks a bit strange right now. Sure does, Jemaine replied, gaze going back and forth between the hill and the commercial district. Do you mean to say we have to walk for two hours to buy something? Soul Eaters will convey anyone that needs to travel from district to district. There are designated routes and stops that special carriages will operate on in the future. Going from your new workshop to the commercial district is a ten-minute ride. Will it cost us anything? No, it is an essential service for this place, Lady Zaradnik told her. The service will go out to the villages, as well. Soul Eaters do not have the expenses associated with maintaining horses, so it is not much of a burden on the budget. But it will cost you something, Germaine said. All undead labor is leased out, no? Wagons require maintenance, as well. That is true. The service has a significant impact on the town budget at the moment, but the burden will be spread out as more and more people move in. The wagon went down a shallow ramp leading into the central depression. At the bottom appeared to be a wide road. The Soul Eater turned left, picking up speed as it advanced towards the distant hill. Do you intend on turning the entire island into a city? Jermaine asked. And fortify it, Lady Zaradnik answered, though doing so will be a long process. While building materials and labor are not much of an issue out here, having skilled professionals move in is. So we are your answer. A part of it. The Sorceress Kingdom's desire to protect its technology works to the advantage of territories like mine, but it is not the only thing we have going for us. Before the wagon made another turn, they passed an area where rank upon rank of death knights, death warriors and other types of undead germain hadn't seen before were organized. Each one stood perfectly still, equipment gleaming in the mid-morning sun. Warden's Vale will also be a major installation for the Sorceress Kingdom's armed forces, Lady Zaradnik told her. It will not only be a place to base the undead servitors of the Royal Army but a facility to train the living as well. The living? Germaine frowned, why would the Sorceress Kingdom need the living in their army? The undead are powerful enough. Everyone has something they excel at, Lady Zaradnik replied. The Sorceress Kingdom encourages its citizens to pursue these paths. Leaving the undead formations behind, their wagons continued following the road until it reached a huge complex of stone buildings at the southern base of the hill. The area it covered was at least eight times that of Erantel's main plaza. Her apprentices cast uncertain looks towards one another as the procession stopped. You're kidding me. Germaine resisted the impulse to rub her eyes. As well as being an alchemical manufactory, Lady Zaradnik said, residential quarters are located on the premises. 
In the future, this site will also serve as the faculty of alchemy for the magical community here. The Baroness hopped down from her seat, turning around to face Germaine with a charming smile. Welcome to your new home, Miss Lanez. Germaine frowned down at the black iron key in her palm, wondering if she was in way over her head. Baroness Zaradnik had approached her several times over the past few months, trying to enlist her service in various ways. Every attempt was, to put it bluntly, suspicious, her proposals were too open, too comfy sounding, and too nice. The lack of any apparent disadvantage to Germaine made it seem like a sweet trap with some mechanism that existed beyond her ability to perceive. Standing on the grounds of the future faculty of alchemy, something that had entirely slipped her mind when considering the whole affair came crashing over her. For all of her open, straightforward behavior, Ludmilla Zaradnik was a noble. It wasn't as if Germaine had literally forgotten this fact, but what it meant hadn't been applied to her new liege. People stepped lightly around nobles in Rias ties for good reason. They legally owned the land, held authority over its people, and a noble oversaw the enforcement of justice within their territory. This hadn't changed one bit in the Sorceress Kingdom, if anything, it was even more strongly upheld with the powerful undead forces now at their disposal. Every word and action that a noble took was an exercise of economic, political and military power. Humble little merchants like Germain Linas were a simple matter to crush underfoot. Sure, people could fight and maybe they could do some damage, but ultimate victory would inevitably belong to the noble in charge. In Rias ties, if one managed to hold out against a minor noble, then their liege would be obliged to step in. Continued defiance would eventually bring the problem all the way up to the king, who was similarly obliged to defend his vassals. At that point, life was over, and one could expect all manner of assassins, adventurers and workers coming for their outlawed heads. Having someone like Azuthendra popping into one's home and disintegrating them for a tidy sum was something that no one could do anything to stop. Germain could only imagine that getting on the bad side of the sorceress kingdom's aristocracy was orders of magnitude worse. Each and every one of them had the power to destroy entire countries at their immediate disposal. Each noble in the sorceress kingdom was also only one or two steps away from the crown when it came to passing problems up the hierarchy. Are you sure you do not want to select your residence first? Lady Zaradnik asked. The tread of the Death Knights unloading Germaine's equipment sounded from behind them. Squeezing the key in her hand, she sent her apprentices away to find their rooms. That can wait, my lady, she replied. May I take a look at the manufactory, first? If you wish, Lady Zaradnik replied. The requirements that you delivered to me were for a much smaller building but hopefully the architects have constructed something that still meets your standards. My standards, Germaine muttered. Right. Forgive me if I offend, my lady, but your ambitions appear to exceed my standards. Is there any need to defer to me at all? I am not an alchemist, Lady Zaradnik told her. I am not even a magic caster. I am, just a border noble. I apologize if it feels like all of the burdens are being placed upon your shoulders. If it is any comfort, there are several other arcane artisans in the domain. There are probably many things that I do not understand when it comes to your trade, so it might do some good to interact with them. So long as you do not breach any regulations, of course. Of course. The Baroness had somehow gotten quite a number of mages to move in. For all of her claims that she was a simple border noble, she clearly had connections to the right people. Erantel had not suffered any further dips in its own population of arcane artisans since the months after the annexation, so it was a mystery as to where they came from. Rias Ties' nobles had little in the way of strong, international ties, never mind with magic casters of any sort. The ratio of professional magic casters in Warden's Vale, roughly 2% of the total population, was already absurdly high. By comparison, the rest of the region had ratios of anywhere between 1 in 5,000 to 10,000 for magic casters of the second tier, which was the bare minimum required to make a living as a magic artisan. The way Baroness Saradnik went on about it, however, one was lent to the impression that she could barely scrape up a single novice. Germaine led the Death Knights carrying her equipment to the front door of the main building. The structure had no windows, though there were what appeared to be vents sticking out of the walls. The entire complex was located on the southernmost end of the city, presumably so that the fumes from their craft didn't waft over the entire length of the island. Inside the first door was a vestibule with a small desk along one side. A lobby? Germaine murmured. 
Yes, Lady Zarudnik said. There will be an elder lich at that desk. A small team of undead servitors will also be working as the building's security. Unauthorized persons will not be allowed past this point, be they friends or family or even visiting dignitaries. What about the warehouse? The warehouse has its own means of access, but cargo transfers will be directed from the inside. The only beings that are allowed to go in and out of the building from there are the security forces and soul eaters with their wagons. These measures were daunting enough to disqualify mundane attempts at theft or espionage. Germain wondered what the Baroness had in mind for more capable intruders. A long hallway stretched out to the right of the second door. Two magical lights shone down upon the polished floor, one where they entered from the lobby, and another over the door to the next nearest room. Lighting supplies are limited for the time being, the Baroness said apologetically. For the time being, I only have enough for the first workshop. Only the first workshop. Germaine cast her gaze into the distance, counting the doors lined up all along the hallway. There were at least two dozen of them. Everything you do here seems exorbitantly expensive, my lady, Germaine noted. Is there something behind your, ah, uh, bold projects? This island you're building everything on is enough to fit four holy rantles end to end, walls and all, and still have room to spare. Most people would be more conservative with their resources. That would be true if we were closer to the city, Lady Zaradnik nodded, but, as I mentioned previously, things are, flipped on their head here. In the city, the price for materials is high due to the costs associated with labor, transportation, storage and administrative expenses. Space is at a premium and there are citizens aplenty competing for work. Out here, I have all the basic resources and space I could wish for. In contrast, I have just over a thousand people for a domain that's almost as large as Corlin County. Out of curiosity, how much did this entire complex cost you? In terms of gold, about a third as much as purchasing your shop in Erantel and fixing it up. Germaine shook her head. Ridiculous. If it's so cheap here, why not use that to attract migrants? Your own resistance to moving here over the past few months should be explanation enough, Lady Zaradnik's voice turned wry. People decide where to migrate based on where they believe the greatest opportunities lie. A city presents far greater and far more opportunities compared to a sparsely populated frontier territory, so I will not be able to compete on that front until Warden's Vale has a small city of its own. Farmers and woodsmen might consider coming here of their own accord, but not the vocations that you tend to find in towns and cities. And that's why you're forcing the development of this industry in your domain, Germain waved a hand loosely around them. Industries that my territory holds inherent or legal advantages over others in. Yes. There are certain key industries that offer far greater potential for development, but other places in the Sorceress Kingdom are more suited for them. I would not be surprised if one or more of the other nobles has already taken steps to secure them. In the meantime, the falling cost of living makes it easy for them to hold on to their populations while they transition to these new industries. The discussion had drifted far beyond her area of expertise as a merchant. Figuring out things like broad economic development and the management of large populations was the realm of aristocrats and rulers. Not that they succeeded all the time, but Germaine decided to leave well enough alone. She tentatively reached out to open the first workshop door. Within was a space roughly five times the size of her workshop, with a ceiling over three stories high. It gave off a cavernous feeling without any furnishings, and probably still would after setting everything up. This is, ah. Uh, Big, Germaine tried to keep herself from gawking as she walked around. Every door in that hall leads to a room like this. Yes. That's a lot of cosmetics, she smirked. As long as you can find the materials to process. I have read that alchemy has many products that assist in daily life, Lady Zaradnik said. This is at least true, in part. It sure is, Germaine said, but every city has their own alchemists. There's also the fact that every alchemist tends to keep the formulas they've developed to themselves. That will not be an obstacle here, Lady Zaradnik told her. The proprietary rights to all research and development in Warden's Vale belong to House Zaradnik, as is everything constructed in the territory. If our most profitable export ends up being cosmetics, I do not mind that at all. I will not allow other avenues of research to remain unexplored, however. Returning to the entrance of the room, Germaine shifted uncomfortably. 
Seeing the Baroness' investment into the facility and having such lofty expectations made her hesitant to broach the topic that was most important to her. Is there somewhere specific you need this cargo placed? She looked up from her thoughts, realizing that the Death Knights carrying her equipment were still standing in the hallway. Just along the wall here is fine, Jermaine said. Just be sure to set it down carefully. I'll get the brats together to start setting things up after we've ordered the furnishings we need, that was the plan, wasn't it? It still is, Lady Zaradnik nodded, but you should see about getting moved in first. There was also something else I would like you to get started on. They left the Death Knights to their work. Lady Zaradnik led Jermaine out of the building and across the complex's plaza to a large dormitory that stretched across one side of the grounds. The door was propped open, and she found her bags just inside. They went up two flights of stairs to the top floor, where Jermaine saw a long hallway that looked suspiciously like the one in the manufactory. I feel like there's gonna be a workshop behind every one of these doors, she said. A more unique appearance might be called for in the future, Lady Zaradnik's voice took on a bit of a sheepish tone, but the buildings coming up right now will have the same style. Even the home I am currently staying in looks much the same as the ones to either side. Feel free to pick any room you wish, this entire floor is reserved for unmarried master artisans. But they all look the same, right? Right. What do you mean by unmarried? We cannot exactly house families in a dormitory, so proper homes outside of the citadel will be provided to accommodate them. Jermaine picked out a room at random, dropping her bags off beside the simple bed that lay within. In addition to the bed, there was a desk, a chest of drawers, and an armoire. All were fashioned from wood in the same, ubiquitous style. The buildings, the furniture, she suspected that many things might look quite Sami and Warden's Vale. It spoke of a place with too few artisans and too much work to do. At least everything was nice and spacious. You said something about a citadel? She asked after coming back out. Walls will come up at some point in the future. Lady Zaradnik explained. Once our immediate priorities are addressed and suitable staff are gathered, the northern third of this island will serve as the citadel of the city, with facilities like this one occupying the outer areas. The inner citadel will be up on the hill behind this complex. Won't the administration have problems with another city overshadowing the capital? By the time this harbor grows to become a city, Erantel will be far larger. There will be well over a million people in the duchy in a few generations, Miss Lanez. Ah oh, really? As far as she knew, the duchy had a bit over half a million when it was a part of Ria's ties. About half of that number fled over the border following the Battle of Katza Plains. It is a conservative estimate, Lady Zaradnik said. The Sorceress Kingdom can produce enough food to feed millions even with its current allocation of land to agriculture. There are also regions that our nation has extended their control over with uncounted demi-humans who may migrate as well. What about all the undead? Jermaine asked, do they count? Baroness Zaradnik blinked at her question. Did she say something wrong? I am not sure how they are counted, the Baroness replied in a quiet voice. Lady Zaradnik's hand moved to fiddle with a silver band around her right middle finger. After a moment, she produced a key from one of her far too convenient magic bags and gestured for Jermaine to follow. Near the front of the hallway, she opened a door and stood aside. When you have the time, Lady Zaradnik said. I would like for you to analyze the contents within. Jermaine leaned over to look into the room. Rather than bedroom furnishings, it contained rows of shelves. Upon those shelves were numerous wooden crates. What are they? Magic items. All of them? Yes. I don't recall the Sorceress Kingdom destroying a small country recently. It was not a small country, Lady Zaradnik said. Just a large army. Jermaine frowned at her reply. When did this happen? Around the beginning of last month. You, you mean those rumors are true? About the demi-human army? It was a demi-human army, yes. Not a single remnant survived, as far as I know. There is no need to worry for your safety here. Jermaine placed a hand on one of the shelves to steady herself, pretending to scan the contents of the room. The rumor was so ludicrous that she had dismissed it out of hand. Something about millions of demi-humans swarming into the upper reaches of the Katza River, only to be crushed by the royal army. House Zaradnik's territory being where it was, one would naturally conclude that it was Baroness Zaradnik that conducted the defense as the noble responsible for that area of the border. 
She understood that followers of the six great gods were fanatical about human supremacy, but she didn't realize that they hated demi-humans that much. On any other day, the Baroness looked like a young and earnest noblewoman, if not a bit cold. Certainly nothing like a merciless killer with the blood of millions on her hands. These things aren't cursed from being exposed to so much bloodshed, are they? Jermaine asked. They do not look cursed to me, Lady Zaradnik answered. You can tell? Um, what I meant was that nothing strange has happened in the weeks that they have been in storage. The group cataloging salvage from the conflict used appraisal magic to identify these. Jermaine pulled out an item from the box. It was a leather cord with cerulean beads and black feathers. A necklace, or a bracelet? Considering it was from a demi-human, it might have gone elsewhere. If they've already been identified, Jermaine said, what am I analyzing them for? The elder liches are not crafters, so I would like you to investigate that end of things. Like what you were doing with those cooling boxes before they blew up in your face. Despite the painful reminder, a thrill of excitement washed through her. Eh? You'll really let me do that? This is what you want to do, is it not? It is, but even if these are minor trinkets, they're still worth a fortune altogether. They'll be worthless once I'm through with them. I do not mind, Lady Saradnik said without a moment's hesitation. They have been set aside for that very purpose. If you can learn how they are made and gain knowledge beneficial to the magic item industry here, it will have been well worth the cost. Make sure you carefully document your studies. Jermaine went from crate to crate, glancing over their contents. They were almost all minor magical items, but they represented a rare opportunity to make a thorough study of demi-human crafting techniques. Many previously unknown spells and enchantment methods potentially awaited discovery. I'll get to work right away on this, my lady, she wondered which item she should start with. You cannot, Lady Zaradnik told her. I, I can't? You still need to head to the commercial district and order the furnishings required for your workshop. Ah, uh, right. I knew that. After introducing Jermaine Linez and her apprentices to the various shops they would need to work with, Ludmilla parted ways with the gaggle of excited villagers and returned home. Home was a temporary residence, one of the three-story shop houses built around what was currently the sole plaza in the harbour's commercial district. The move was made while she was away before the old hill was refashioned into the one currently looming over the island. With the uncertainties that came with her new state, she regretted having chosen a location so close to her subjects. Still, having an office and hall to hold audiences and conduct the business of her fief was a necessity. She only spent as much time as was required to keep up with work before heading off to continue her self-imposed seclusion. A patrol, an inspection, investigating something far removed from other people. There were many plausible excuses to keep herself at a safe distance. Welcome back, my lady, Willuvian greeted her as she passed through the living room. Ludmilla smiled and nodded in reply, eyeing the half-elf's growing belly as she passed her to go upstairs and into her bedroom. Was it really safe for her to be in such close quarters with a pregnant woman? Much of her time in the weeks following her return was committed to observing the various types of undead working around her territory in an effort to understand herself. One of her first worries was that, like many types of undead, she would leak some sort of miasma or aura that would adversely affect living things nearby. The servitors of the Sorcerer King, however, showed no signs of leaking in any way, shape or form. They went about as neatly packaged bundles of negative energy within their undead bodies. It was also true, however, that the undead capable of emitting such effects were not made available for lease. That being said, it appeared the opposite of leaking was happening to her. When she had gone to examine one of the patches of negative energy, it was a concerning blotch that occupied the location of one of the former residences on the old hill. Tendrils of darkness started seeping out towards her. She fled in alarm, her thoughts filled with the idea of some dark force entering her body and taking control of her. Ludmilla avoided even the tiniest wisps of negative energy she could spot from then on. The next day, Ludmilla returned with a death knight, a bone vulture, and a skeleton laborer. She tentatively ordered them near the patch of negative energy, but it didn't react to their presence. When came closer to them, the darkness started drifting straight towards her. She retreated again to ponder the result and what it might mean. According to the common knowledge of the region, undead beings manifested in areas where negative energy accumulated. Where the undead manifested, it was possible for more powerful undead to manifest if enough lesser undead were gathered. 
just based on how things were described and the new sense for things that came with her undead existence, Ludmilla wondered if this explanation originated from another undead being. The living had a vague sense for the undead and places where the undead could rise, something like a premonition or a sense of foreboding, but it could not really be described in those terms through that sense alone. After some thought, she decided that some part of this rationale was flawed. In the months that the hundreds, now thousands, of undead servitors in Warden's Vale had been here, there wasn't a single case of wild undead appearing. As for advanced knowledge about the undead, she just so happened to have over a dozen necromancers in her domain. Ludmilla had put off meeting with them for some time now, so she made up her mind to head out and get several matters settled at once. Headed out, my lady. Willuvian asked as Ludmilla came back down the stairs. Yes, there are some things I need to catch up on out in the villages. Would you like some lunch? Her maid asked, it's just about done. Go ahead and take your time, Ludmilla answered. I am uncertain when I will be back, so please do not delay anything on my account. Understood, my lady. Ah, Nonna dropped off a few messages this morning. One of them was from Lady Corlin. Ludmilla froze in her steps. She had not seen Clara since before her return, and this was the fourth message in half as many weeks. Please leave everything on my desk, Ludmilla told Willuvian. I will take a look at everything once I return. She left the building with a frown, plagued by guilt over avoiding her best friend. Normally, she stayed the night with Clara once a week, but Ludmilla refused to simply come by as if nothing at all was the matter. The proper words to convey her undead state eluded her, and it seemed foolish to put Clara at risk of harm with so many unknowns. She also dreaded how Clara would take the news. If she broke off their relationship on the spot. Ludmilla shook the increasingly dire thoughts away. She needed more time to figure things out. Her life was very much the same, but she herself had become something else. Sometimes it felt as if she was merely a spectator in her own life, going through well-worn routines and carrying out the plans established by her former existence. A burst of laughter rose from a building nearby. Jermaine Linez and her apprentices were still where Ludmilla had left them, surrounded by admiring residents. Her subjects in the harbour fancied themselves proper city folk now that the course of development was made clear before their eyes. They leapt on any opportunity to make themselves appear more urban and, in Warden's Vale, this meant having new houses, new furniture, new fashion and all manner of new magical items. A young and attractive arcane artisan like Germaine Linez was instantly the centre of attention, and she wore their welcome well. Ludmilla made her way off of the island and across the new dam with its new mill, careful not to appear as someone tirelessly sprinting all the way to the first farming village. The second harvest was already well on its way, and she passed between green fields just beginning to show heads of grain. Farmers and their skeletal labourers could be seen tending to the crops and occasionally a cart delivering goods to the harbour crossed in the opposite direction. Upon entering the village, Ludmilla quietly slipped into the light tower and went to the second floor. She took a deep breath, adjusting the ring of non-detection that had replaced her ring of sustenance. Shortly after returning to Warden's Vale, Ludmilla decided that it wasn't right to keep Sigurd's cowl of warding, and she had both it and his necklace returned. Though Lady Shiltier was not very sympathetic to what she considered an overblown set of worries, she still provided Ludmilla with a ring of non-detection to prevent others from detecting her new undead state. Hopefully, the former Zernorn necromancers didn't have some way around it. She was greeted by the scowl of Isabella Aguado, who came to answer her knock on the door. The scowl promptly vanished. Lady Zaradnik, she opened the door fully, then lowered her head in greeting. Welcome. Did. Did I miss an appointment? I'm pretty sure nothing came ahead. No appointment, Ludmilla told her. I'm still catching up on my work around the fief and came to address some things here. Was I interrupting anything important? Nothing that requires my undivided attention, Isabella replied. Please come in, my lady. I was just trying to figure out how this stupid fetish was made. The stupid fetish was most likely one of the magic items from the demi-human army. Germaine Linez was not the only artisan she had put to task analyzing them, each staff to Tellier in her domain had been delivered several to study. Progress was slow and breakthroughs were non-existent in the month or so since they had started, but Ludmilla had no expectation of things being so easy in the first place. On the way to the desk sitting under one of the windows, they passed a long counter where a dozen black sheets of fabric were laid out. 
These sure are popular. Aha, Isabella looked over her shoulder. In hindsight, I should have been making these from the start, but old taboos are hard to shake off, even for necromancers. Once I started showing them around, though, everyone wanted the things. Even the lizardman. The lizardman? A corpse is a corpse is a corpse. The sheets on the table were each a shroud of sleep, a magic item permanently imbued with a gentle repose spell. They were not fashioned in the form that those who usually employed them would be familiar with. Dyed black to hide stains and made to hang on a rack, they were now being sold for household use. The magic item was generally used by temples or adventurers to preserve corpses for resurrection or burial but, as Isabella had put it, a corpse was a corpse was a corpse. Any dead animal, be it a fish or a deer or a human, was a corpse. The shroud of sleep did not discriminate. All one had to do was wrap it up within, and the magic item would prevent the corpse from rotting. With this item, every household could store unprepared meat for long periods without worrying about spoilage. Though Isabella was aware of this application long before her arrival, she never sold them for fear of being identified as a necromancer. In Warden's Vale, however, no one cared so long as you obeyed the law. The Shroud of Sleep, rebranded as a sort of preservation item for unprepared meat, ended up as one of the top sellers and most profitable magic item in production so far. Unlike items with a preservation effect, they were limited to corpses but in exchange were a fraction of the cost. The item had broader effects that belied its unexpected application. Other magic items that complemented its use, such as ones that kept flies and other vermin at bay, could be smoothly introduced. This not only directly increased the profits of her magic item industry but acted as a sort of primer for her subjects as to how magic items were integrated into daily living, which further promoted interest in new products. It had benefits for the environment as well since the wastage that came with meat storage was eliminated, thus reducing the burdens placed upon the land by hunting and livestock. Her concerns over securing enough supplies to produce preserved meats for her growing population also vanished. Speaking of corpses, Ludmilla said after they settled into their seats. I had some questions, no, to be more precise, I would like to lean on your expertise about a certain concept. A concept? Something to do with magic items? It has to do with necromancy, Ludmilla replied. Or at least I think it does. Isabella gave her a long look across her desk, shifting slightly in her seat. Before migrating to her former home in Riestiz, Isabella lived in Robley. Openly speaking about necromancy-related topics in the Holy Kingdom was decidedly not conducive to one's well-being, and Riestiz was not much better. Once they had gotten over their initial excitement, Isabella and the other Zenorn migrants had fallen into a tentative pattern of behavior when it came to their once hidden vocation. They were more than happy to practice their craft and conduct research behind closed doors, but their public face was still that of unassuming arcane artisans. Though they no longer needed to hide, the old habits that revolved around cultural taboos were hard to shake off. What concept are you referring to? Isabella asked. Negative energy, Ludmilla answered. Or at least negative energy and its relationship to the undead. The common sense around here is demonstrably at odds with reality, and this leads me to wonder if it has any truth to it. It does, and it doesn't, Isabella told her after a moment's thought. What the people believe about it happens to naturally occurring, ahem, wild undead. It doesn't happen with summoned or created undead. It being the case with all undead is just superstition and rot from certain religions, like the faith of the four. They don't make any distinctions over undead origins. Concerns over having wild undead appear because we have so many created undead around here is not a worry at all, if that's your worry. Ludmilla nodded to herself as Isabella's explanation confirmed her suspicions. If that is the case, Ludmilla shifted the topic slightly, what is it that leads to the appearance of undead? As the one responsible for the security of this domain, it would be best if I distinguish common sense from the truth of the matter. The truth, huh? Isabella pursed her lips, as nice as it is to see someone that doesn't choose to wallow in ignorance, I'm not sure if I can offer you a definitive answer. I thought Zernorn is an organization dedicated to the pursuit of necromantic knowledge. They are, Isabella nodded, but the way Zernorn operates isn't as great at spreading necromantic knowledge as it is collecting it. Each group functions independently, answering to someone higher up. A lower rung group in the cabal only has a piece of the picture, and each member only really knows what their group does. 
The people that communicate with the higher-ups are few. I suspect that the people at the top of the hierarchy are the only ones that have the closest to what you'd consider a complete picture. Isabella smirked to herself, resting her chin on her hand. You know, that offer of yours back then hit us in more ways than one. How so? The way you propose to run things here is something like the opposite of how most arcane organizations function. Magic cabals, even government institutions like the Imperial Ministry of Magic, guard their knowledge jealously. The fruit of your efforts here is also confidential if you've forgotten. I understand that, Isabella waved her free hand in the air, but it's not what I meant. Like Xenorn, it's those that exist at the highest levels of any organization that hold the most knowledge. They hoard it, keep it away from those below. Most of the Xenorn members that have come here, and those that will arrive in the future, all come from these isolated groups that the mysterious people above us string along with bits of knowledge. We work like crazy just for the chance that one of the elite gives us some scraps. Even with a closer relationship, like that between master and apprentice, it's the same dynamic. I see. I assumed what was happening here wasn't anything new. At a very basic level, it's not anything new. The difference is that this barrier, where our superiors jealously guard their knowledge, won't exist. Even the Imperial Magic Academy only teaches the basics. Past that point, you have to sign up for the Legions or the Ministry of Magic. There are indeed some spells or theories that you probably don't want in the hands of the wrong person, but they keep a tight lid on everything. The community you're trying to build here doesn't exist out there, at least not for all the small people. What Chandler said back then means more than you know. Ludmilla wondered how Isabella would react if she told her that the faculties in Warden's Vale were modeled after the institutions of her faith rather than any arcane organization. The temples had ranks of administrative authority, but the greater the number of priests and clerics there were serving the faithful, the better. Even maids were allowed to learn. Now that you mention him, where is Chandler? He prefers to study in his room, Isabella replied. I get to bug him about missing you later. Anyways, sorry for getting off topic. Negative energy, Jem. Well, the common sense isn't too far off from what I know. Is there anything wrong with it? Not explicitly, Isabella said. It's more like the common sense is very broad. Broad enough to spook people and blow minor things out of proportion. You get one little skeleton and people think that the place is on its way to becoming the next Katza Plains. Many of the families here have become accustomed to their undead servitors, Ludmilla told her. A child that is not aware of the true nature of the one little skeleton that they find lost in a meadow one day is a tragedy waiting to happen. I, I didn't mean it like that, Isabella frowned. Sorry. With the way you put it there, I guess identifying the sources of negative energy accumulation would be a noble's first priority. Most people know the big ones, battlefields, places where the dead are gathered, like graveyards and crypts. Places where a whole lot of pain and suffering happen. Battlefields. She had just turned the upper reaches into a battlefield. Death knights were placed along the river bank in her territory just in case anything washed up, but Ludmilla wondered what the wilderness beyond her southern border looked like now. How long does it take for a place to start giving rise to the undead? Ludmilla asked, Katza Plains and the Erantal Cemetery are clear examples of this phenomena, but the border has seen conflict since this place was settled. The demi-human tribes out there have been fighting amongst one another for far longer. It takes a lot to get things started, Isabella answered, but once it exceeds nature's capacity to clean up, it's hard to get rid of. The temples have tended to the Erantal Cemetery since there's been an Erantal, but the place still has undead popping up on a regular basis. As for the frontier, it's like I said just now, nature has a way of cleaning things up. You might have undead showing up after wars and such, but to have things end up like Katza Plains requires some sort of unthinkable catastrophe. I thought Katza was the result of intermittent conflicts in the past between Riestais and Baharuth over the valuable river basin. Isabella snorted. It doesn't take much to poke holes in that story, she said. The kingdom, the empire and the theocracy all have claims on the region dating back centuries. The kingdom has been around for less than two, and the empire is younger than the kingdom. There might have been a conflict there in the past that caused it all, but Riestais and Baharuth didn't exist back then. In all likelihood, it was between a theocracy and whoever used to be there until the demon gods wiped everything out. The histories of the region never brought up that point. It was something that Ludmilla found curious, 
but what was the chance that one could find a historical record from a source closer to the truth? Regardless, Ludmilla said, I would like to keep my fee free of wild undead. Nature cleans things up and priests can work to cleanse or at least suppress it, but I still don't have any priests. Is there anything necromancers can do? As our population grows, it will become a more pressing issue. Not us from Zenorn, Isabella said. Our focus was sort of in the opposite direction. I see. One last thing before we move on to other business, how do wild undead interact with areas of negative energy? That is a very good question, Isabella told her. One that I only have speculation and rumors to answer with. Soul eaters eat souls or something, and every second person seems to think that all undead do. Elder liches are said to grow by absorbing mana over their long existence, but I have no idea where that story came from or why everyone seems to believe it. There's probably a reason why the undead linger around their birthplaces when they can just as easily pack up and go elsewhere, but whether it's because of ambient zones of negative energy is anyone's guess. We all get that sort of creepy feeling when we're around those places, but it's not as if any of us can see it.